<sighs> Hope I remember to hit record. Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you've been well. Today, we're talking about the Howell Campfire propane fire pit. So here it is, buried in, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 inches or so of snow. I wanted to come up here on the top of this mountain just because I figured it would be a, a sweet spot to film this video. Just kidding, actually, it's just my front yard. But, it is some gnarly conditions. It's about 15 degrees outside right now. Uh, I had the propane tank and this just in my truck because I was planning to go somewhere and try and film a scenic, scenic one, but roads are, roads are pretty crappy. So I figured might as well do it in the yard because it's kind of scenic, right? All right, we're warming up now. Have this thing on full blast, just cooking right now. So this is a fire pit, it's a cool one. I'm gonna talk about it in this video. Obviously, quick intro there. Acquaintances of mine, the, the guys who founded this, I've known them for, for a handful of years now. I've kind of been tracking the project. So this is a Colorado company, uh, actually made here in the USA, but made here in Colorado as well. We'll show some manufacturing details a little bit later. We're gonna talk with uh, some of the guys there, founders and presidents, and I don't know their titles, but We'll talk to them later in this video. And I just wanted to show you it because I think it's one of the coolest products in kind of the camping overland outdoor space to come into existence in, in a while. So if you watch my latest Weekender Lander video or Talon's latest camping video actually, well, might be a video or two back now depending on when I post this. You saw the Howl Campfire. I showed it, I talked a little bit about it. Talon talked a little bit about it in his video as well. Um, this is a prototype unit that the guys just kind of lent me. The production, the first production run I think is underway. By the time this video posts, they may have already shipped. So the first people that got their first pre-orders in may actually already have this unit. But this one is just a loaner that they uh, sent out to me. I want to be upfront about a few things. They didn't pay for this video. Uh, this isn't, they didn't even give me a fire pit. Maybe, maybe they will later, I don't know, hopefully. But I just thought it was such a cool product that I wanted to make a dedicated video of it because there's kind of a lot to talk about. Um, so let's let's get a few things out of the way up front. Like, what's what's special? What's special about this product? So it's a propane fire pit that actually produces a meaningful amount of heat. You can see right now it's kind of windy. It's it's flurrying a little bit. I don't know if those are coming through on camera, but the heat is all going this way, a traditional fire pit, the heat would all be getting lost. The winds would be flicking around, you'd burn yourself. That's kind of what the top fire is on here. It's not really producing a meaningful amount of heat, especially in the wind. What makes this unit super, super unique in the space is that it has these things, they call them bar coals underneath. And they try to basically get the real heat that you feel from a real campfire, the coals from a real campfire, and put it into a propane fire pit. So bar coals, they're bars that kind of emulate the heat of coals. Uh, that heat is IR heat. So it's unaffected by wind, and it's just like shooting directly, basically line of sight of the bars. You're gonna get heated. So the main, the main big difference is that it produces a bunch of heat. Like, it gets too hot if you're too close to it. So it's the first fire pit that really produces heat. So that, that in and of itself is huge. Now, it is an expensive piece of kit. This was, uh, I got a lot of comments on the video complaining about the price tag, which I totally get. I also agree that it is an expensive piece of kit. I got called a hipster for saying it was a good piece of kit. I don't know what that had to do with it. Maybe because it's just like a weird, they think it's a weird Gucci type product, but it exists for, for a couple reasons. We'll talk about this later in the video, but the founder wanted fire. They were out in the mountains and I may be butchering the story a little bit, but there was a fire ban. So they couldn't make a real fire. We live in Colorado, the, all the founders and owners and everything, they live in Colorado as well. Fire bans are a real thing here in Colorado. They happen all the time and then you can't have campfires and then you're stuck with a propane fire pit. 
Previously, you were stuck with a propane fire pit that didn't produce any heat. So if you wanted to hang out by the campfire, you're still shivering, you're still freezing cold. So they said, hey, there's probably a way to fix that. And that's this product. So US manufacturing, a lot of R&D, it's a startup company. Uh, they're, they're producing them in small batches here in Colorado. And they're super, super, super high quality. And there's a bunch of different, what makes them like cost more than the traditional fire pit, in addition to what I just kind of talked about, is the components in the manufacturing process. The, the bar coals, the different injectors, the different uh, whole housing of the body. It's very heavy, it's quite large, it's stainless steel, and they wanted to design it to, so where it's not a throwaway product, where this lasts the life of your camping adventures and you pass it down to your kids. So there's a lot of user serviceable parts and it's just beastly. They wanted to design it to where if you basically dropped it out of the tailgate of a lifted truck onto the concrete, it would survive that no problem. So does that justify the, the price tag, which I don't know what the price will be when you're watching this video, but at launch, I believe it was $1,300. It's an expensive fire pit, no doubt. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really beat around the bush there. Uh, it's a somewhat niche product, but if you are affected by burn bans or you just want the ease of propane, hook up the tank, turn it on, have heat almost instantly. The bar coals take a little while to heat up. Much easier than a traditional fire. Now I love traditional fireplaces. I'm gonna put a wood-burning stove in my house. The last two houses I had had wood-burning stoves. I love sitting around a campfire. If you've watched my Weekender Lander videos in the past, you've seen me talk about different types of fire pits. I like the BioLite one a lot. I like fire but sometimes you can't have a fire or sometimes this is just a lot more convenient if you're waking up in the morning and you wanna kick it on uh, without having to go through the whole fire making process. Again, I like making a fire, I love fires. Some of the founders, I've talked to them, they, their love for fires is, is that of my own. So not to say this will completely replace traditional fires in my life by any means, but it's a product that fills a pretty big void hopefully avoid that I kind of explained. Ah, this is nice. I just got up, <laughs> walked around a little bit, but it was too cold. But what I'm gonna do probably now, I wanted to do the intro out here and do all this stuff, but this, this is gonna be a little bit easier to talk about inside, probably on a tabletop. I'll show you the features, kind of show you how some of the stuff works so I can touch and point and not burn myself. So I'm gonna flip this off. We're gonna take it inside and continue the video. Okay, back in the warmth of my house. Actually, it's a little cold. I'm in the basement. I'm in my, I'm in my office. I started working on like a YouTube wall backdrop. So we're kind of in an official, we're the, like in an official YouTube filming space. So here it is on the desk. Like I said earlier, it's a pretty big unit, pretty heavy unit. I think it's 34 pounds, roughly at the longest, widest part, I'll say it's about 22 inches at the feet, which are the widest by about 16 inches by about 13 inches tall. So those are the dimensions. Again, mo pr predominantly made of stainless steel. There's some uh, aluminum parts for kind of heat shielding and some other stuff there. There's this orange powder coating thing. It's a bunch of little Stuff, you know, there's a bunch of little components in here, little dials. It's essentially like three fire pits. You got two of the bar coals, and then you got the, the main kind of beauty one on top. You can run the top flames and the bar coals separately. Well, both of the bar coals will always run together, but you can run the top and the bar coals separately. Uh, there's a little bit of an adjustment here, but not, not super, it's not, there's not super fine adjustment. It's, kind of full blast or lower for both the top and the sides. There are some people that asked if you can cook on the top. Technically, they can't advertise that you can cook on the top. They probably can't tell you to cook on the top either, but it's a flame. It, it gets hot, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't wanna use like nonstick stuff because it'll just melt through, but if you got some cast iron or something, and you could probably just throw it directly on, but I would probably put it on some kind of grate that raises it up a little bit, and I'm sure you could cook on here as well. So, 
This is it. The top kind of has these, let's see here. The top kind of has these holes. It's where the fire comes out. This is, this is where all the pretty stuff comes out. Flames will also come out of these two tips here and it's like blue flame. So in the daytime, it's pretty much impossible to see. So when this is running, never put your hands over this area because you will get burned. It's like, uh, like a kind of like a blowtorch coming out of these things. And you can kind of think of the bark holes as kind of as a blowtorch. Honestly, that's, that's kind of the mechanism, high pressure gas getting shot in to these. These are kind of like radiant tubes. If you've ever been, I mean, they're usually in warehouses and stuff where there's radiant tube heaters above you. And it's just like whoosh, melting your head. This is like a shrunken down version of that. I haven't, I haven't edited this video, obviously. We talk about a lot of this stuff when I'm over at the Howl HQ, so some of this would be repetitive, but just kinda wanna give you a quick rundown of everything. On the bottom is a quick detach. I'll just set it down here. Quick detach hose mount, so that's kinda nice. The propane hose just in and out of there, and then has these bumpers down here. What these bumpers are for is really, they want you to be able to kind of combine this. I'll show you later when we're at the HQ, the propane tank, a 20 pound propane tank, and the unit straps together. It's got a couple lashing points here, and kind of makes it one unit. So with the propane tank strapped to this, it's bigger, and the setup for that really is propane tank, here, sorry, I should grab a protein, propane tank, but we're about to eat dinner. I'm trying to wrap this, this portion up. So propane tank here, strapped to it, so you get one big honking unit. That's not something you're gonna wanna lug around, really, but you can if you want, because they put this handle here. So if you're just hauling it a short distance, that's fine, but again, it's 20 pound propane tank plus 34 pound Howl campfire. So that's the setup there. There's also a few different lashing points they've put in the legs and stuff so you can really uh, strap it down. They've made this, again, like I said earlier, heavy duty so it'll take a beating in the back of your truck. You don't want this thing just like launching around in the back of your truck because it's heavy, has like some kind of, not sharp sharp, but at speed with weight, some sharp legs, so you're gonna wanna strap this down whether you got the propane tank on it or not. I'm trying to think of what else. The nice thing also, I, it's you know, they're not glowing orange, so they're kinda hard to see. They will glow orange at night, like at nighttime, these will be orange. The nice thing is you can control them separately so you can turn off this. You will still get some blue flame coming out of here, but if the vibe you want is not fire, you're trying to, I think they call it like stargazer mode when just the bark holes are on, you can turn this off but still have heat. So that's nice. It's kind of like sitting around the coals of a fire without the flames. I like that. And then the other thing is since the bark holes are here, again, the IR heat is really a line of sight heat. So from the bar coals, the heat goes kind of up at an angle over here out and then slightly downward. Not directly, that's why this heat shield's under here. I think for all their UL certifications and stuff, they the, the underneath it can't get too hot. Uh, so you could, I, I think they don't tell you to use this like on a deck or something. If you have treks or something that might melt, I don't know, probably play it by ear, see how hot it actually gets. We may take this out on my deck which is uh, infused bamboo product and roast some marshmallows on it because it's kind of the vibes, the snow, the first snow of the year. So I may go get some family marshmallows with this out on the deck. So I don't know, that's kind of it. That's kind of it in a nutshell. And why don't we go ahead and head over to Howell right down the street from me and we'll talk more. I filmed this portion of the video like two or three weeks ago though, so we'll get into it here. Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you've been well. I'm here at Howl Campfires, Howl HQ. We're gonna go in and talk to, I don't know their titles, owners, founders of the company. We've got the wall of prototypes here. 
and then production unit back here, and a couple of the guys that know more than I do, obviously. What's going on, guys? Uh, my name is Randall Slim. I'm the CEO of Howl Campfires. This is uh, Alex Tinnenbaum. He's one of my uh, co-founders here at Howl. I don't do a lot of these videos where I'm like interviewing other people, so we're, this is just off the cuff. They'll talk about stuff. I'll interrupt them from time to time when I want to talk about other stuff, but that's, that's how it's going to go. So. Take it over, guys. So we are in, uh, this is kind of our R&D lab here at Howl Campfires. Basically, uh, what we've got over here is the Howl Campfire R4. This is the uh, first production unit that we put up for sale. Shoot, I guess it was last week. And uh, we basically just kicked off manufacturing at our facility here in Denver. Shoot this week, so we're hoping to get these things out to people in the next three or four weeks. But uh, basically what this is, is the only propane campfire in the world that's actually warm. And I don't say that to be silly. I mean, like, literally, this is the only one that has ever been intentionally designed to put out what we call thigh melting heat. And the reason I can say that is these things are certified by uh, governmental bodies and basically... Uh, the category that these things are certified under is outdoor decorative gas appliance. So the category that these things are certified under was intentionally never designed for propane fire pits to put out heat. And that was really the reason we made this product. We'll jump ahead a few years. This project started three years back. I'll let him talk again. Don't worry. But this is the fire pit. And before we get ahead of ourselves, maybe we just kick it off in else. So as a propane fire pit, this is what you're used to with propane fire pits, right? You got a fire on the top, looks cool, doesn't put out a ton of heat, but it's a nice ambiance. What this has are these tubes on both sides and these transfer radiant and IR heat. So you have basically two mechanisms, the pretty flame and the heat flame. So that's what Amongst other things, that's what kind of sets this apart. Just wanted to show that real quick before we start talking about everything else. These heat up, turn orange, looks cool. I'll show you later. All right, sorry for that awkward interjection, but that, that's what we're gonna be talking about this whole time, so we have some context. So basically, uh, summer 2020, if you lived in Denver, you knew kinda, it was, it was pretty post-apocalyptic. It was uh, raining ash down in Denver, the East Troublesome Fire was ripping, that was actually the second largest fire in Colorado, and that was caused by a backcountry campfire that got out of control. And so uh, Alex and me and a few other buddies that lived around or were from Denver were kind of thinking, man, you know, like, I wonder if there's actually a, a way to fix a wildfire problem. And what was the fundamental problem was, well, you know, when people go camping, they don't want to not burn wood because all propane fires right now kind of currently suck. So we started thinking, you know, what actually makes uh, a wood fire good? And what actually makes it enjoyable to use? Well, it's actually warm and it's super packable. Those were two core components that we really honed in on because, you know, pretty much every propane fire that was out there will make the nice flame and, you know, that's good for whatever, for looking at, but it's, it's not going to really do anything for you if you're up in the mountains and it's windy or raining or, you know, the weather changes in the mountains all the time. So we really wanted to design a product that was in, in every way possible, not a compromise to a campfire. And that's really what the Howl Campfire is. It's an homage to the wood fire. So what we basically did was we reverse engineered what makes a bonfire warm. And it's not really the flames as much as it is the bed of coals. Those bed of coals get super hot and they start shooting out, when they start glowing orange, they start shooting out infrared light. And that infrared light will actually basically shoot out to you no matter the wind, rain, or snow and start warming up the water molecules within your body. And honestly, I'd let Alex get into more of the science of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to geek out with you guys. So basically, exactly like Randall said, um, IR light uh, comes out of the wood coals, and this is what kind of the miracle about a wood fire, is that wood coals emit photons at these very specific frequencies that are multiples of the natural vibrational frequencies of water molecules. So you're made of water, and that means that wood coals make you warm in a way that, that almost anything else in nature doesn't. Um, so we wanted to replicate that exact feeling that you get around a wood fire, 
having that wood coal heat in a propane system that was burn band compliant and really safer, a lot safer for the forests. I uh, was just tired of seeing the forest getting burned down, but also really uh, tired of missing out on the, the true campfire experience when there is a burn band. That's one of the things I hate. Uh, being, I live in Colorado as well, so it's cool that these guys are in Colorado, but you'll go out, you wanna go camping, it's cold, you wanna start a fire. Even finding out where there are burn bands is like impossible. You're like, what county am I in? Is there a specific one for this forest? Does this trail have a burn band? So it's really hard to plan ahead. Sometimes I've been out on a trail, no burn bands. I get on the trail right at the front of the trail. It says burn ban in effect. I'm like, well, I brought all this firewood for nothing. So the whole burn ban aspect, depending on where you live, maybe that doesn't affect you as well, but here in Colorado, it does a ton. So, so okay, so that was kind of the first two problems that we wanted to overcome. How do you make a, a, a propane fire that is actually warm like a wood fire? And how do you make it packable like a couple bundles of wood? Um, you know, what we were struggling with was propane campfires that are, you know, either filled with a ton of like lava rocks and then, you know, those things spill out, create moon dust all over your rig. Or you've got these like really puny, uh, ammo can style ones, which basically is just like lighting a bunch of birthday candles in a, in a shoe box. Um, and n none, none of those really are the, the experience of a wood fire. Um, so we wanted that. We wanted the full experience of a wood fire and we wanted it in the gnarliest conditions imaginable. Um, so as we continued, you know, developing this new technology, um, you know, it was okay, can, how can we test this? What kind of conditions can we run it in? So wind, high winds and, and a wood fire is really dangerous and, and ultimately your, your coals will get scattered, the, the thing will blow out, it's like it's kind of a bad deal. Um, the bar coal operates at 120 miles an hour of wind. Uh, the A-flame goes up to 45 miles an hour of wind. Um, and, and really there's, you're, you're not dealing with like the embers or, or sparks blowing around. Um, Let's talk about water. So if you leave this thing out in multiple days of, of deluge, talk about like a Pacific Northwest storm system or something, somewhere if you left wood out like that, or if you got drenched overnight while you're camping and your wood gets soaked, um, you know, those situations, wood is just not very effective. You're not gonna get warm very quickly with, with soaked wood. Um, whereas the Howl Campfire, you know, you get that thing super wet, uh, it, you know, even while it's still raining, you can still light it right up and you'll be warm within about three minutes. I mean, the, the point of all this, it seems kind of silly to be talking about spraying down a, a propane fire pit with wind and water and all this stuff, but to go back to kind of the origin of this whole product is, we wanted to create something that was so good that you would prefer it to burning wood. And we knew that if people were gonna actually use this as a true backcountry camping tool that needed to work in crazy wind, it needed to work in crazy snow, freezing, freezing temperatures, uh, you know, wind rain, altitude was a huge one too. Like, I don't know if you've ever used something like, uh, let's call it a Mr. Buddy heater. Those tend to start falling apart at about 9,000 foot elevation. And so one of the biggest obstacles that we actually had to overcome was creating a system that not only put out incredible heat uh, when it was windy, raining, and snowing, but also worked at any altitude on Earth. And that's kind of what I have in front of you to kind of show you guys how this 100% primary air system works. So to Mike's point, it's kind of like a, a, a mini jet that we made here, but basically what you have is um, this is a 100% primary air system. And what that means is that we shoot in gas right here. That gas shoots down this Venturi right there and is sped up and then crashes into what we're calling the burner head here. And this is a uh, circular mesh stacks. It's about six of them that we stack together. And what happens is, is that high pressure propane pulls in the proper amount of air and fuel no matter what altitude you're at and then combusts right here at the end of this burner head. All of that lives inside of this tube. And you can see the line right there. That's where the burn starts to happen. And then this tube gets superheated up to about 1200F and that starts glowing like wood coals in a wood fire. But really the challenge was, how can we make this tube work at any altitude? And we were able to do that basically by getting our pressure high enough from the gas jet that it would pull in the same amount of air at sea level that it would at the top of 
I'm going to say Everest. That's, we've never gone up there, but let's call it Pikes Peak. Yeah, we've got to test that one day. <laughs> um, these are actually, what, were these are Swiss machine screws you were saying? Swiss screw machine shop. So these are, create, these are like made at the same shops that make a Rolex watch. So these are super, super highly precise parts. And that's incredibly important because for this system to work and for it to work at the PSI that the government requires, all of these parts have to be incredibly precise. So what Mike is referring to there is this thing is made in a super, super precision machine. And one of the other parts that is super precise is this mesh stack. So each one of these mesh stacks is laser cut out and the whole orientation is rotated five degrees every time um, so that when we stack it all together, the air and the fuel has a clean path through. What we ended up finding out, and this is getting way in the weeds, was that when you don't orient those holes properly, it ends up creating an occlusion and the system just doesn't function right. Basically, the moral of the story is we have a ton of race car-esque machine parts in this thing, and you really actually need it in order for the system to work well. Yeah, it's a lot more complex than I'm gonna explain, but basically, propane, this is turned around that way, but for the sake of showing it, shot through a tiny hole at the right pressure, goes through this, goes through this, mixes with some air here, ignites in here. This actually has baffles in here even. It's kind of, it gets a little more scientific. We were talking about suppressors and all that kind of stuff to kind of slow the heat transfer, make this thing heat up more evenly. This gets to 1200 Fahrenheit and at some point there starts to glow orange and emit IR heat. So that's correct, absolutely. That's well what's going on there. So the IR heat, why don't you, well you guys talk about that, why the IR heat is more important than the flame heat and why it's really what sets this thing apart from, well one of the, one of the things that sets it apart. For sure, so I mean, basically what we found with traditional propane fire pits is you just, trying to heat people through convection and hot air rises obviously. So if you've got all your heat is basically hot air, it's just gonna go up and away from you. So if you've ever used a traditional propane fire pit, you kind of have to get like this over it to get any sort of warmth. And that really doesn't work in the real world. If you're sitting around a quote unquote campfire in a chair, you're not gonna stand up and go like this. So what this led us on a path to was how can we find something that's mechanical, that's really durable, that puts out the same kind of infrared heat that a wood coal would. And what we found was industrial radiant tube heaters. So this system that's on this unit is, as far as we know, the world's smallest industrial radiant tube heater. And I think it's the only naturally aspirated industrial radiant tube heater. Because traditionally these things have fans and blowers and electronics, and they need all that to move the air and the gas through the tube to get the thing hot enough. But that system that Mike was just walking you through, basically we got the pressure and all these technical parts figured out just right so that we could get the air and the fuel in there, down the tube, so that it would get it up to that uh, 1200F, so it would glow just like wood coals in a wood fire. And that is really, that infrared light is what is, quite frankly, it's soul warming. I mean, you sit around this thing, and after a few minutes, it's just like sitting at your wood fire at your house, your back starts burning, your legs start burning, you want to kind of turn around or back up. And that was really what we were looking for. It's like, man, what makes a bonfire great was you go and stand over there for a couple of minutes, you're like, God, I gotta step back. Like, this thing's intense, man, it feels good. Like, I feel comfortable out in this freezing environment. That was really what we were trying to replicate with this product. 100%, and it really is just the difference between flames and coals, right? So flames are the luminous band of the exhaust gas in a combustion reaction, so it's exhaust gas. That's what makes flames. Um, hot gases. So hot air, hot gas rises and blows away when you're outside. It doesn't really do anything to, to keep you warm when you're at camp. Um, the reason you get warm around a wood fire at camp is those uh, infrared, it's that IR light coming off of the wood coals um, and that energy stacks up on you over time. So that's why when you, you know, get in front of a bonfire, you know, for, for the first couple minutes, you're like, oh yeah, no, this is like comfortable, feels good. And then as that that radiation stacks up on you over time, you go, whoa, like I'm actually really getting hot. My pants are hot, my thighs are melting. I gotta back up, I gotta, I gotta turn and toast the other side. Um, and that's, the, that's what we're replicating here with the Howl Campfire. 
So I've been nerding out here for the past hour or so, just talking all about heat certifications, the processes, kind of the, the manufacturing processes as well, because I'm really interested in all of that stuff. So I, I'm actually pretty, pretty intimately familiar with, with the whole setup. I don't know how much of that you guys care about. So we're gonna do like a very truncated version of what we've been nerding out for the past hour or so, just because I feel like, I feel like you should, you should care about the three-year journey of a brand new product and kind of what it takes to, to get to market and some of the things that they value uh, and some of the loopholes they had to jump through. Some of the concepts that they wanted to do was durability, right? Packability, you want to throw this into a truck, you want to, you want to huck it, we got the Raptor out here just sending it. And they've, they've, they've damaged a lot of prototypes in the process. So they wanted durability, obviously, and this is their own thing. There's not really like UL certification ratings for durability. So they did a lot of, a lot of testing to make sure if you drop this off your tailgate by accident, because it's bound to happen, it won't shatter into a million pieces. But in order to get a product like this certified so that they don't get, uh, so you don't get sued, you don't burn the forest yeah. down, all this stuff, there's a lot of regulations, you got a, a lot of testing that they've had to do so they've done a lot of that. And I don't know if you guys just want to talk through yeah, all of sure. that briefly. So basically, and Mike, I appreciate the love on that. Um, you know, in order for this thing to be safe in the National Forest, it has to be certified by UL Intertech or CSA. Uh, UL was the folks that we worked with. And this thing has to, the core tests that it has to pass are CO emissions, um, wind tests, rain tests, uh, and heat temperature tests. And there's a bunch of other small tests, but those are the real big core challenges. And honestly, one of the biggest issues was no one had ever miniaturized an industrial radiant two Peter. No one had ever tried to get a miniaturized industrial radiant two Peter certified in a category other than the radiant two Peter category. And so like the regulatory bodies just didn't necessarily want to touch it. it and it's not because they were afraid of it, it was just, it was too much work for them. So it was a multi-year battle to really find somebody who finally wanted to work with us and believed in us to actually get this product across. And so Bob at UL, he's a great dude, he really, uh, he asked us, hey, will this pass the test that you designed it for, which is outdoor decorative gas appliance? And we said, yes, sir, it will. Um, and the core behind that was, look, it has to be able to light in uh, a 30 mile an hour wind. It has to be able to, not go out in what is more or less a hurricane force rain. So they take this whole rig, it's got about, imagine like seven shower heads on it, and they're just blasting this thing with water while the thing's running, and it can't go out that entire time. And I wanna say that's a 30 or 40 minute test. And one of the other things that's actually really neat when you get to experience these things is we can't heat up the ground more than 90 degrees. So when you're actually running this thing, even if it's been running for hours and hours on end, you'll notice that the ground is cool and the legs are cool. And the way we were able to do that is really, not that we know anything about metallurgy, but basically blending different alloys. So we have an aluminum heat shield next to a stainless steel body. We have aluminum uh, reflectors and basically testing and blending all these different metals through more or less hundreds of experiments allowed us to figure out, okay, we can put out heat to the users, we can put out heat on the top, but it, we figured out like by mixing all these different alloys and trying different shapes and all that stuff and different airflow paths that we could have a product that gave you all of the effects of a bonfire without any of the negative downsides for the forest. You know, it didn't heat up the ground, it didn't put out embers, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot to it. Again, you guys probably know by now I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd. So different metals heat up differently. Some are used for like heat, like aluminum is used for heat sinks. So it transfers heat differently than something like stainless steel. So they have different layers of different metals all through here. So you may see just like a box, right? A box that makes heat, but really it's like, very precise pressures, very precise air mixtures, very precise angles and bends, baffles. The, the main kind of top flame system probably is a little, the, the easiest part of this thing. But everything else, in addition to the durability and, and you know whatever else they wanted to bake into it, that's where the three year timeline kind of comes into play, I guess. 
for sure. Basically, the biggest challenge was the category this thing had to get certified under had a pressure limitation of five psi, and the problem with industrial radiant tube heaters is they normally have fans. So in order to get enough air and fuel down tube at such a low PSI meant that we had to get hyper, hyper efficient in terms of precisely getting our air and fuel down there, mixing it properly, but not doing it in a way that was so restrictive that it slowed it down and prevented it from getting the heat down the tube. And that was really the majority of what we did. We ran just hundreds of experiments, making minor tweaks here and there, messing with stuff like the mesh stacks we showed you, messing with stuff like the jets, messing with the amount of air that we stuck in there, baffles, the way we turned the tubes, the way we set everything out, it was all just one kind of ongoing fail, repeat, try again experiment. And that was after really building the platform, the foundation for all of that knowledge on mathematical and, and computational modeling, uh, fluid dynamics modeling. I mean, we had a lot of data to start with. Um, you know, thankfully through some really technical, technically minded friends of ours um, and folks that we hired to, to help us with these problems. Um, but even once we had that, I mean, it was, it was months and months of micro tweaking and trial and error um, to really get the, the correct flow of fuel, uh, air and heat to move through these pipes and, and really get them to, to work like wood coals. Yeah, so these, the, the bar coals they call them, little, you know, they kind of look like exhaust pipes or whatever. The, the key is in a bigger industrial thing like Randall was talking about, you have fans that can more kind of precisely control the flow of heat and combustion. They didn't want this thing to have to be plugged in. They could have developed this, this thing with little micro fans and blows it through, but then you'd need a power source, you'd need a needed battery, you'd need it electronics, you'd need to plug it into a goal zero or something like that. So this is the only thing you gotta plug it into is a propane tank. Just figured that was worth pointing out. So one of the interesting things about it, this has, what was it, 13 and a half hours of runtime on just the bar coal? So yeah, so we're six and a half hours on A-flame and bar coal. We're 13 hours on either bar coal or A-flame, so. Gotcha, so A-flame's yep. the, the visual beauty flame on top. Bar coal is what's actually putting out the majority of the heat. You can run them both on at the same time six and a half hours, or you can run just the flame or just that if you just need the heat. This is called, what, stargazing mode, you guys are calling it? Or something, yep. right? Stargazing bar, mode? Yep. Bar yep. coal only is stargazing mode. Stargazing mode. Yep. Uh, it puts out a lit, kind of a blue flame coming out of here. I'm sure at this point in the video you've seen that. If you just care about the heat, you don't want it, you can do either way. So that, those run times are based on a 20 pound propane tank. You could use a smaller propane tank, it's just you're gonna, you're gonna burn through it pretty quick. So this was, Randall was kind of explaining, briefcase carry, they didn't wanna make it awkward to carry, two hands, all weird, so the handle is just right here, and you can just carry it like that. Uh, the other interesting thing is, it's designed around the 20 pound propane tank, so it'll kind of nestle in there and strap down with a few little lashing points. In the back of the Raptor over here, we actually kind of have a, another unit set up, so you can kind of talk us through this. So basically, one of the worst parts about propane fire pits is this tank. Uh, if you were to have an accident or if you really wanted to go off-road and wheel your truck, this is an unloaded missile. Uh, that was my, <laughs> honestly, one of my biggest issues is I wanted to still be able to jump my truck and kind of do silly stuff with it. I mean, that's why you buy a Raptor. So uh, it was really important that we find a way to not only get the fire pit secure, but also the tank. Uh, and this is actually something that we were fortunate enough to be able to patent. But basically... You tilt the fire pit over, you lay the 20 pound tank on top, and you run, this is just a, this is called a roller cam buckle as a company. We like them because you can put a lot of good leverage through that little wheel in there. But you put that over the tank, through our slots on the fire pit, crank it down, and we've got some rubber feet just to give it a little bit of grip on the fire pit. And then basically, the universal mount here is to just put it in the bed of your truck, and then we're gonna run a strap through what we're calling the strap lock slots up here. 
The longest part is the ratchet. But the idea was really like, we don't want you to have to have a super custom mount to carry this thing around. We just wanted anybody with a pickup truck or a Forerunner or even a Subaru to be able to strap this thing down in their car. So you get that thing tight. Shut it in. Now it's locked down. Give it one more. Crank. So this That's is good to the go. approved Randall full send method of strapping it down. Uh, a lot of little nooks and crannies on this, so you could probably make your own journey and find what strapping system works for you. But this is kind of what's baked into the system with the slots attaching the propane tank mount. Sweet. Oh, also worth noting, the cool down time for this is basically they just kind of arbitrarily said 60 minutes. May cool down faster than that though, especially depending on your ambient temperature. So use some common sense when loading this against, you know, something with plastic there. Make sure it's cool enough. All right, so another cool aspect of this, I guess, is when it comes to kind of manufacturing and whatnot. This is a made in America product. Yes, sir. So you guys talk more about it. So basically, um, this thing is incredibly precise. And to be totally honest, trying to build this thing overseas would be next to impossible because of the amount of precision that it requires to build all of these parts and not only build them, but assemble them properly. The reason this thing works as well as it does is because it is a very finely tuned, I hate to use the metaphor, but it's kind of race car-esque. It's gotta be very dialed in. The cool thing is once it's dialed in, it's incredibly durable, but you gotta do it once and you gotta do it right. And so from the get, we're like, we need to be close to where this thing's made and we want to make it in America if we can. Um, and so all of this stuff is actually made in Thornton, Colorado, just a little bit north here of Denver. And it has all kinds of fancy parts in it. Tons of, uh, these are five axis CNC machine parts. This is actually an old model part. Um, this is another stainless steel Venturi. This is machined as well. These mesh stacks are laser cut. The frame over there, that is laser cut and then press break bent. And the majority of our parts are actually laser cut and press break bent. Um, and these guys that Mike was referring to, these are what's made on a Swiss screw machine. And this one's a little bit beat up from us R&Ding it. But basically these things have to be incredibly precise. They basically have to be perfect and absolutely flawless so that the uh, propane system doesn't get messed up when it's in operation. Um, all of that to say, one of the kind of high level goals of the company was like, look, we want to be able to show that you can make a high quality American made product and make a good profit on it without having to, you know, hurt the people who are making the product. We wanted to make something that we can make enough money that we could pay the people who are making the product well they could live good lives and we could also create something that you know was an incredible world-class product so one of our bigger goals with this company was to build a super high-end fully american-made product that was actually game-changing uh, and that's pretty darn hard to do in america because we don't have incredibly cheap labor so you have to be very very intentional uh, about all of your processes. What machines are you using? Because our labor here is quite frankly quite high and that's okay. You need that in order for people to have a good paying job. That's what we want. But that means that we cannot cut any corners. We have to be incredibly smart about the parts that we're sourcing, how we're cutting, laser, you know, bending. It, it comes down even to just how do you design the product? How do you design each individual part um, for, for efficient manufacturability? And uh, Randall's done a, an incredible job of that. Our, uh, our lead engineer, Diego, is, I mean, the guy is a genius when it comes to really designing each of these, you know, these, these really complex parts for efficient manufacturing, um, given the machines, given, you know, the exact tools that we have to use here, uh, like Randall said, up in Thornton. Yep. Yeah, so that's been... Uh... It's been cool to see. That was always kind of a dream for us. Can we actually make something that's a world-class product and do it with enough margin to be able to pay people well and honestly make a little money for the company? So, yeah. Nice. So manufacturing of this product is still in its infancy. They actually just uh, basically sold out of their first production run, and this is they kind of limited it to make sure 
really the first manufacturing run went smooth, worked out any kinks, uh, stuff like that. So as I'm filming this, you can't quite get this yet, but why don't you guys talk a little bit more about plans for sale, how someone can get their hands on this in the future, for whatever, sure. that kind so, of stuff. I mean, basically you can have this thing, uh, if you ordered it last week, you're gonna get it here in about three weeks. If you didn't, uh, we're gonna have another drop here at the end of the month, um, sometime close to Halloween. Now, I, in order to get notified and not miss out, uh, you'll need to give us your email address and you can do that at howcampfires.com. Sweet, howcampfires.com. Also, I've been following along the journey on, on Instagram. Is that kind of your main social media platform right now? It is. Yep. They're sharing production updates, testing. I've kind of watched this thing, the whole journey of it over, I don't know how much of it has been public, maybe for about a year or so now. Yeah. I've been yeah, kind yeah. of watching it. So it's been really cool to watch all the proto tests. They've been very open about uh, all the certifications and everything this thing's had to go through. So I'm stoked for them that it's finally a product that people can buy. So... <laughs> I don't know. We are too. <laughs> yeah. Randall's saying he lost a few years of his life probably. <laughs> a little hair, a couple of years, but uh, no, we're, we're pumped on the end product. We're excited for uh, for you guys to actually feel this thing. Um, I think that uh, you're going to be pretty delighted when you get to use one of these guys out in the wild. Also, so they have, like, I, well, I'm lucky enough to live in the same state as them, so they've brought it to a couple events that I've been at. Uh, they've had it at Overland Expos for the rest of the year. Do you guys have any plans of where somebody might happen to be that they can actually see and feel? Because really the difference is, yeah, it looks cool. You see it. It's it's a nice, cool, industrial looking product. But the difference, the feeling is believing, I guess, for this. So <laughs> is there anywhere that people can... I would say follow us on Instagram. Um, that's going to be where we're going to tell you where, where all of our events are going to be. Um, you know, we're we're definitely looking at, at a large schedule of uh, getting this out there because that is, I mean, you know, like Mike said, it is feeling is believing. We've got to get this in front of people so you guys can not just like watch this on a screen and go, huh, like you actually come be around it in person, have that in real life experience and go, oh man, like. Yeah, this is this is what I've been missing. Um, so we will be uh, we'll be touring it for sure. But uh, just keep up with us on Instagram, and hopefully we'll be uh, we'll be close to you here soon. Sweet. So yeah, sign up for a newsletter if you're interested in purchasing. Follow on Instagram if you just kind of want to check out the journey. All right, guys. Well, thanks for uh, watching to the end of this video. It's a random video. I don't know how it came together. Hopefully it was good. But here in Denver, Colorado, rad to see this company. Uh, kind of the whole process not you know they're kind of acquaintances of mine not like my best buddies or anything like that so yeah so yeah maybe now <laughs> maybe now um so yeah i'll leave all the links down below and you know probably i'll be using this in future weekender lander episodes and stuff like that so until next time guys take care take care